Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all here today. Also, greetings to everyone who is watching the service online, whenever and wherever you are doing that. Um, it's always helpful for me as the pastor of the church to know how we are serving you. So if you are watching it, send me a text or an email or a comment or just something to help me get a sense for how we are able to serve you. I forgot to mention this last week, and so I'll say it today, that we are now in kind of a funny little mini-season of the church year called Gesematide, which is probably the only time this year I'm going to say that word and the only time you're going to hear the word. We call it Gesematide because the three Sundays are named Septuagesima, Sexagesima, and then Quinqua Gesima. Those Sundays, and so that refers to 70, 60, and 50, which is the approximate length of time for how far away we are from Easter. And so I think the best way that I've heard the rationale explained for the naming these Sundays that way has been that even though we're not yet in the season of Lent, we're already seeing like the mile signs on the highway for how far away we are from Easter. Kind of like how you'll start seeing Salt Lake City mile signs already when you're in Wyoming or Idaho. So we're already looking forward to that great event. For the liturgy, we're going to be using Rite 1, the Bugenhagen order, and we'll begin today with the opening prayer. <coughs> o Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray you to open our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that through the preaching of your word, we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. We sing the verses of hymn 72, and please note that we rise for verse 6.
Let us confess our sins to God and pray. We poor sinners confess to you, O God, not only that we have been conceived and born in sin, but also that throughout life we have often and in many ways offended you, our Lord and Maker, in thought, word, and deed, so that you could with perfect justice reject and condemn us for all eternity. Therefore we come before you with sorrow of heart, in dread and terror of your holy justice and of everlasting death. Our sins are a grievous foe, which we should hate in every way as long as we live. O merciful God, you still grant us in this hour to be reminded of your fatherly goodness. According to the promise of your word, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and implore you, dearest Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, our brother, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised again for our justification. Forgive us all our sins through faith, which the Holy Spirit increases in our hearts to full assurance. We therefore pray, O Lord, through your servant, to declare to us the forgiveness of all our sins. We poor sinners are willing to forgive all who have offended against us. We earnestly desire to grow in true godliness. Help us, O God, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Hear the holy and comforting word of our Lord. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Lift up your hearts. By the authority of God and of my holy office, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to God in the highest. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have sown your holy word among us. We pray that you will prepare our hearts by your Holy Spirit 
that we may diligently hear your word, keep it in good hearts, and bring forth fruits with patience. And in all persecutions, comfort ourselves with your grace and continual help. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 10 through 13. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy, and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Here ends the Old Testament reading. We now continue with the psalm. How can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word? With my whole heart I seek you, let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. I delight in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning is now, and ever shall be forevermore. Amen. The epistle reading is from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 16. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight but all are naked and exposed to the eye of him to whom we must give account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest 
who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in help, to help in time of need. Here ends the epistle. Please rise. The Holy Gospel for this Sunday is from the 8th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, verses 4 through 13. And when a great crowd was gathering, and people from town after town came to him, Jesus said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it, and some fell on the rock. And as it grew up, it withered away, because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil, and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience." Here ends the reading of the Holy Gospel. We confess the Holy Christian faith according to the Nicene Creed. may be seated as we sing hymn number 230.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the beginning, after God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them, and after God had created man in his own image with the capacity to love and serve God in righteousness, when the heart of man was still perfectly good soil, the devil came and sowed his seed of doubt and unbelief. That seed took root immediately, and it bore the fruits of hardship, suffering, and death. The perfect relationship that had existed between God and mankind was now broken. So was the relationship between man and woman. Mankind fell into sin and lost the image of its creator. Sin caused the heart of man to be simultaneously as hard as a rock in resisting God's word, but also susceptible to all the thorns and thistles of the devil's lies that always seek to choke out whatever word of truth we hear. Ever since the devil first sowed his seed, mankind has been plagued by the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh. The original sin that was committed in the Garden of Eden has been passed down from generation to generation, corrupting the hearts of men and women from the womb. For just as any fruit tree bears its own kind of fruit, so also sinful men and women bear their own kind of children, passing down sin, sadness, and death to every future generation. No one who is born according to nature is exempt from this. We are all infected by it. But right away after the devil had sown his seed and that seed had taken root and borne fruit, God made a promise to Adam and Eve, and he became the sower of another seed. God's seed was the promise that the consequences and condemnation for all sin would one day be paid for by the woman's seed, who would come to crush the devil's head and restore the hearts of mankind to God. So ever since the Garden of Eden, there have been two sowers in the world. Down through the ages, God and the devil have continued to sow their seed. The devil sowing doubt, temptation, idolatry, and evil. And God sowing, through his Old Testament prophets, the seed of the promise of forgiveness, restoration, and eternal life. This sowing continued until God kept his promise by sending his eternal son into the human race. Jesus came to the world to preach the mysteries of the kingdom of God. The good news that despite the original and ongoing sinfulness of mankind, of the human race, that God still loves it and he still wants to save it. That is what Jesus' parables teach us. They don't teach us that we need to look inside ourselves and examine our condition to figure out if there is something about us that either made it easier or harder for God to save us compared to other people. The parables of Jesus teach us about the will of God to save mankind from the sinfulness and death that we are all equally and completely infected by. Especially thinking about the parable in today's gospel reading, Jesus gives us the key to understanding it. And it's a good thing that he does, because if we were left on our own to try to figure it out, there's a good chance that we wouldn't, thinking that the seed in the parable of the sower represents something else than it does. For example, in the parable of the tares and the wheats, which sounds similar to this, same farming idea, the seed in that parable represents people. But in this parable, it doesn't. Jesus tells us that the seed is the word of God. Now, the parable of the sower is not just found in Luke's gospel. It's also recorded for us in Matthew's gospel. If we look there in the 13th chapter, 
we see that Matthew includes a small thing that Luke doesn't include. That the seed is the word of the kingdom of God. So we know that when Jesus says the seed is the word of God, he is talking about the gospel. The parable of the sower wouldn't be a good example to follow if you were working on a farm planting crops. In the parable, the sower is sloppy and reckless. He wastes his seed by spreading it anywhere and everywhere. But from the way the sower spreads the seed in the parable, we see God's mercy for the entire human race. God sends his word out everywhere. He gives it to everyone. Through his word, everyone who hears it is offered forgiveness and salvation through faith in Jesus. God sends his word out to everyone regardless of if their hearts are hardened against God or not capable of supporting roots or if their hearts are already full of the thorns and weeds of false belief. God is good. His seed is good. And the good seed does what good seed is able to do, falling wherever it's sown and growing. There are some people who have understood this parable to mean that we can figure out exactly why some people who hear the word believe it, while others who hear the word don't believe it. There are some people who have taken this parable to mean that the church shouldn't be so sloppy and reckless as the, par as the sower in the parable was. We should use our limited resources to pinpoint whatever we think the most fertile mission field is. But this parable doesn't have anything to do with demographic studies or other things like that. The parable of the sower doesn't teach us that the fall into sin affects some people less and some people more. So that we who believe would think that part of the reason why we believe is because it wasn't as hard for God's word to take root in us as it would have been for other people. The parable of the sower teaches us about the generosity of God and the power of the gospel. And this parable also serves as a warning for everyone who would reject the word of God either out of hand or who would allow the cares and pleasures of life to snuff it out in their hearts. The seed in this parable is God's word, the gospel. But what's the good soil? The good soil is faith. Faith is the only disposition which receives God's word, clings to it, and bears fruit. But here is the irony in this parable. Faith can only come from hearing, hearing God's word. The seed that is cast changes your heart through your ears. That is why Jesus cried out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And he probably didn't say it in the same volume I just did. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Hear the gospel, which creates that which is needed to receive the gospel. Hear the gospel, which gives you faith in the gospel. Through the word that is cast into your ears, the Holy Spirit has worked to bring you from unbelief into the new life of faith. Through the washing of water and the word, you have been reborn as God's child. The image of God, which was lost in the fall to sin, has now been restored for you. And it bears fruit in love for your God and in love for your neighbor. Through the word, your heart, which was once hard and dry and full of weeds, has been turned into good soil, soil where God's word can be sown and bear fruit more and more and more. And how can you be sure that God meant for this to happen for you? Because you heard his word. God's word never goes somewhere by mistake. If God's word came to you and it has, then you know God wanted his, come, his word to come to you, to give and keep you in the Christian faith and the forgiveness of your sins. 
That is the promise and the comfort for us in this parable. But there is also this twofold warning. Not everyone who hears God's word believes it. Not every seed that is sown sprouts faith. There are hardened sinners in the world who, even though they hear God's word just like you do, refuse to believe it and refuse to receive the promise of salvation through faith. The devil tricks these people into believing lies instead of the truth. He tricks them into thinking that they are too smart for God's word or that they don't need what it offers or anything else that results in God's word not having its intended effect for a person. That's the first warning in this parable. The second warning is for you and for other people who, like you, have received the word of God in faith. The warning is that you are still in the world. You are still someone whom the devil wants as his own. And he will never rest and never stop working in you against God's word to make that happen. True faith can be lost. It can be lost either through apathy towards God's word or a willful despising of God's word. The temptations to sin that we experience in life are real. The sins that we commit when we are tempted are serious. God doesn't laugh or shrug it off when you take his name in vain or despise the means of grace or when you despise your parents or those other authorities in life God has given you for your good. God doesn't laugh or shrug it off when you do harm to other people through your words or actions, or when you lie, or when you steal, or when you don't think that the vocations and relationships God has given you in life are good enough. There are real thorns and weeds in your life which the devil would love nothing more than to work through to choke your faith. Good soil can become bad again. Hearts restored to God can be lost from God. On this side of eternity, you are never going to outgrow your need for God's word. On this side of eternity, you can never just follow your heart. You will make mistakes. You will stumble. You will sin. You will hurt those around you, either by mistake or on purpose. But God always provides the way forward through repentance, faith, and restoration. God always gives healing through the gospel of his son. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for all your sins. The sins of your past, the sins of your present, and even the sins you haven't committed yet. There is no sin that you were born with or that you have committed that Jesus doesn't have the power and authority to forgive through the gospel. Not in a parable, but in real life. God has ensured that the gospel is brought to you. God still calls pastors to spread his seed by preaching his word and administering the sacraments so that God can keep you the faith-filled fruit-producing child of his that you are meant to be. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In our prayers today, we especially remember the family of our now sainted president, John Molstead, who died about a week and a half, and a half ago suddenly. And we also remember a friend of the congregation, Gil. Gil is the owner and operator of the Gardner Village Farm, where we have had more than one youth group activity. Bobby informed me that Gil was in a rather severe car accident last night. Let us pray for the church and for all people according to their needs. Please rise. Lord of the harvest, you send your word down on earth 
to give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. You are living and active among us, calling to repentance and raising to new life. Lead us not into temptation and protect us from the crafts and assaults of the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh, which do not want us to hallow your name or let your kingdom come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the harvest, we give you thanks for all of your tender mercies. Plant in us your holy word, that in good and honest hearts we may keep it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the harvest, send forth laborers into your harvest, that we may be preserved in the pure teaching of your saving word, whereby faith toward you is strengthened, charity increased, and your kingdom extended into all the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the harvest, grant health and prosperity to all who are in authority, especially Joseph, our president, Spencer, our governor, and all those who serve for our protection at home and abroad. Give them wisdom so that they may serve to the maintenance of righteousness and the hindrance and punishment of wickedness, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the harvest, be with all who are in trouble, want, sickness, anguish of labor, peril of death, or any other adversity, especially those who are suffering for your name and truth. We especially pray for Gil and the Molstead family and all those whom we name in our hearts. Comfort them, O God, with your Holy Spirit, that they may receive and acknowledge their afflictions as manifestation of your fatherly will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the harvest, preserve us from false and pernicious teachings, from war and bloodshed, from plague and pestilence, from failure of harvest and famine, from anguish of heart and despair of your mercy and from an evil death. At every time, show yourself to be a very present help in trouble. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the harvest, grant that in true faith we may worthily come to your altar to receive the very body and true blood that your Son has given for our redemption. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have sown your holy word among us. We pray that you will prepare our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that we may diligently and reverently hear your word, keep it in good hearts, and bring forth fruit, fruit with patience, and that we may not incline to sin, but subdue it by your power, and in all persecutions, comfort ourselves with your grace and continual help. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the preface to Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts unto the Lord. We lift up our hearts unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. 
it is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day <laughs> overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Please rise as we sing the hymn of thanksgiving, number 325.
Let us give thanks and pray. We thank you, Lord God Almighty, that you have refreshed us with these your salutary gifts. And we beseech you of your mercy to strengthen us through them in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated as we sing hymn number 228. Lord, we render unto you our heartfelt thanks that you have taught us what you would have us believe and do. Help us, O God, by your Holy Spirit, for the sake of Jesus Christ, to keep your word in pure hearts, that we thereby may be strengthened in faith, perfected in holiness, and comforted in life and death. Amen. Good morning again. Thanks, Jen, for playing for the service today. I'll just want to point out a couple of announcements in the back of the bulletin. Um, I should say, first of all, that we prayed for Gil, who is the owner-operator of the farm, a friend of our church. I was not given the impression from Bobby that his life is in danger, just that he was given a very good shake by the accident and that the vehicle he was driving is probably not going to be driven again. So I don't want to be concerning you too much, just the right amount on that. Um, uh, you can see the schedule for the Lent midweek services that we're going to be having this year. It's not a series or a theme. And the reason is because as I was considering what we would do for these Lent services this year, I looked at the church calendar on the Synod website and I noticed that there were several saint days on Wednesdays. And then there was one a couple days away from a Wednesday. 
And then Annunciation was a Thursday. So those things slide around very well so that we will be observing those days on our Wednesday Lent midweek services, especially take note of St. Patrick's Day. This year, it's frowned upon to go to bars to celebrate that. So instead, come to church. Um, I'm going to be out of town um, in about an hour through Wednesday night, so there's not going to be Wednesday night church. Also keep Marta in your prayers as she takes care of all of her kids by herself. And then lastly, it is John's birthday today. He is bigger than he was when he was born nine years ago, a little two-pound, 12-ounce baby. But let's sing for him. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear John. Happy birthday to you. I can't tell if he's glowering or smiling under the mask. So, <laughs> Until we meet again, may God bless and keep all of you.